Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this virtual Reading the Forest and Landscape with Tom Wessels. My name is Marilyn Castriata, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Kestrel Land Trust based in Amherst. The mission of Kestrel Land Trust is to conserve and care for forests and farmlands and riverways in the Connecticut River Valley of Western Massachusetts while nurturing an enduring love of the land. Thanks to all who support our work. Thanks to all who submitted photos of interesting things you encountered on a forest walk. I created a PowerPoint presentation of these photos. Tom has not seen them in advance, but will interpret them during the program. He may ask individuals who took the photo about things that may not be apparent. Participants will also be able to ask Tom questions about any of the photos while they are presented. Please unmute yourself when your photos are presented. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Wessels, a terrestrial ecologist and professor emeritus at, Uni at Antioch University, New England, where he founded the master's degree program in conservation biology. Imprinted into the land is the history of how we and other species have inhabited it, the storms and fires that have shaped it in its response to these and other changes. Few people can read that imprint better than Tom Wessels. His acclaimed book, Reading the Forest and Landscape, A Natural History of New England, teaches us how to read the landscape the way we might solve a mystery. Tom has conducted workshops on ecology and sustainability throughout the country for three decades, over three decades. In addition to reading the forest and landscape, he is the author of other books, which I'll copy into the chat for you to check out. I think you're in for a treat. As my professor and research advisor in graduate school, Tom not only taught me how to see and read ecological dynamics of landscapes, but more so, and perhaps more importantly, how to understand life through the lens of self-organization and principles of sustainability. May your eyes also be opened. Thank you and take it away, Tom. Well, I guess we'll just get going to the slides. So bring them on, Marilyn. Okay. Okay, so um, what I'm seeing here is some stilted rooted trees. It looks like a couple of black birch on the left and a hemlock on the right. Um, best guess is that these uh, sprouted up on uh, a stump of another tree, most likely a white pine. Um, if, if I could clearly see a pillow and cradle involved here, I'd say it was on a tip up of a, a down tree's roots, but I don't think I see that. I think I see what I'm seeing is just roots growing down over what was once probably the stump of a white pine tree. Um, it looks like the two central trees, the hemlock and the black birch, germinate at the same time. And then the black birch on the very left, which is quite a bit smaller and has younger bark, came in a bit later. Um, so I guess there is a possibility this was a down tree whose uh, tip up came up. That would be the roots coming up out of the ground when it came down and these tr trees germinated on them. But I can't from the image see if there's a depression where the roots are going down and there's a mound on the back side of the tree that we can't see. So um, maybe the person that took the slide can say if you know that pillow and cradle arrangement is there or not. And if it's not there, then this is definitely uh, evidence of a, a nurse stump and it would have been a pretty sizable, uh, most likely white pine. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, I didn't see any pillow or cradle, um, so maybe it is a nurse stump that was there. That would most likely be the case. I mean, okay. if if it was like a nurse log, the roots would be going out horizontally like this, and they're all going down. So okay. I'm guessing this nurse stump. And you know, um, in the, you know central New England, pretty much the only trees that make nurse stumps are white pine. As you get further north, then spruce does too, but that's why I'm guessing this was a white pine stump. And looking at the bark on the trees, this tree was cut at least um, probably 60 uh, to 70 years before the photo was taken. Oh, wow. 
and maybe longer, but at least that long. Okay, cool, thanks. All right, I guess we can, yeah, all right. Okay, so here looks like another hemlock and this thing really has a lot of cankers growing on it. Uh, cankers are tumorous growths. They can be caused by viruses, bacteria, fungi. Um, it's interesting. I don't think I've ever seen cankers on a hemlock before. So maybe I'm wrong about the tree species. Um, but, uh, and maybe I'm looking at a maple. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but I thought it was hemlock at first, but if it's a hemlock, I've never seen growths like that in a hemlock. So maybe if the person that took the slide knows the tree type of tree it was, that'd be helpful. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I didn't really look, but you know, I should have looked up top to see if it was a hemlock, but I think you're probably right because it was in a, an area full of hemlocks. So that sounds right to me, yeah. um, but next time I go, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, <laughs> Just, sure. yeah. look up to see if it had foliage at this time yeah. of year would help. But um, I mean, that's what the bark looks like, but I have to admit, I have never seen growth like that on a hemlock tree. Huh. So that's okay. pretty, if that's a hemlock, that is definitely pretty unique. Cool. All right, so this is a um, an open grown white pine. Um, this tree uh, grew up by itself in an open area. So most likely um, some sort of agricultural landscape that was abandoned. It looks like from the ground, the, the ground is pretty smooth and even. So um, this could have been uh, a pasture um, at the time of abandonment, but probably originally was a crop field or hay field. So white pines growing up uh, in the open like this um, get very fat uh, terminal shoots, the upper shoot on their on their tree. And that's what white pine weevils go for. Uh, white pine weevils seek out young pines, generally less than 15 years of age, growing in full sunlight that have a big fat terminal shoot about the size and diameter of an index finger. And the white pine weevil is a native insect. They lay their eggs on that terminal shoot. Uh, the, the larvae hatch out, drill into the terminal shoot and kill it. And then the tier of branches down below that terminal shoot grow up to become the new trunk. So um, I know this tree grew by itself. There's nothing else there. If uh, you get, let's say, an area that's agricultural land that's abandoned and, and is seeded in with white pine, and the white pine, the young white pine are all growing up together, they generally will, after the, the leader gets killed by the white pine weevils, they'll usually just send up two new limbs to become the trunks. So to get this many, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, that means that this tree was a solo tree there and uh, basically all by itself and had um, the cognizance that there was lots of light around it and throughout all of its, uh, uh, you know, its, its, its limb roll up to become uh, new trunks. So definitely a white pine hit by the white pine weevil. And so if you see white pines that grow up and their trunks then fork into two or more trunks, um, and there's a number of them in the site, well, that's really good evidence. You're looking at a site that was agricultural land that was abandoned. And if the trees are young enough, uh, white pines put down one tier of limbs every year. You can count how many tiers of limbs there are. And from that uh, age, when the site was abandoned to grow back to forest. In this case, uh, this tree is a little bit too big to do that. Um, but uh, again, definitely an area that was abandoned. Uh, this white pine came in, uh, I'm guessing it was a pasture because it was all by itself uh, and grew up and then the pasture was abandoned and, and a, a younger cohort of trees came in around it. All right, so here it looks like we might have a red oak uh, with uh, barbed wire embedded right in the middle of it. Um, and that tree, if that is a red oak, it's been dead for a while now. So this is probably some pretty old wire that got tacked up into that tree when it was probably a small sapling. Uh, the tree grew, incorporated uh, the wire inside its wood as it was growing out. Uh, the tree has since died, um, lost its bark, has some decay happening. Um, so again, I think that that wire was strung up certainly in the uh, 
first half of the of the the 20th century uh, and maybe very early uh, part of the 20th century. It's too bad there used to be a website called barbwiremuseum.com where you could basically identify every single type of barbed wire that was made in the United States. That site not only gave you the dates the wire was made, but where it was made. And so often you could take an image like this and figure out, okay, this wire was made maybe between uh, 1910 and 1918, and then you would get a good idea of when that was strung up. But that site is no longer active, uh, so we don't have that resource. All right, so we have here a stump that was cut. Um, if this is the same stump in all three images, uh, the one on the right uh, definitely looks like it was multiple trunked. Um, and again, it looks like this might be an oak, uh, just looking at the type of wood I'm seeing, um, which means if that is a double trunk stump, um, that means that this tree was cut twice. And this cutting looks like it happened again, at least, um, I would say 40 years ago, looking at the type of decay and the moss growth on it. Um, and it looks sizable. I can't really tell how big that is, but it looks like it's pretty good size. So maybe whoever took that shot could give me an idea how big in diameter that central photo is, that, that, that stump in the central photo. Hi, Tom. So this is, the, uh, this is also the previous slide. It's the same okay. one. You can see the barbed wire kind of going through it. Oh, yeah, I can um, see it. That, that central one yeah, on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's about like, I don't know, it's probably like 30 inches in diameter. All right. So, yeah. for, I mean, oaks can be fast growing, but even a 30-inch-year-old tree is probably going to, you know, be at least 80 years of age. Yeah, wow. Well. And so if that was strung up to it when it was small... And with the amount of decay, I think we're looking at probably wire that was strung up really close to around 1900. Oh. And, and if that image on the left is, if you're really looking at two stumps in that one thing, like it's a was like a double trunk tree, right? Then, then the tree itself, my God, would have been pretty darn old. I mean, when it was mm -hmm. originally cut. So um, there's there's definitely some history there. But I'm guessing, yeah, that wire is probably going back to at least. 1900 might even be a little bit earlier. Very cool. Thanks. All right. So here we have two walls intersecting. And um, it looks like on the left, the ground on the left hand side of the wall that's running, you know, forward and back through the image, it looks a lot higher than the ground on the right. Uh, now, if the ground on the right is a road, um, then that would be due, maybe due to road erosion. It looks like it might be a road. But if it wasn't a road and we had a, a situation like that, then the area on the left would have been crop field. Um, and the wall would have come in sometime after that crop field had been active for a while. Uh, because on a slope, uh, people plowed the plow furrow, so it went down slope. And every year, soil would migrate down at the bottom of the, the, the crop field. It would build up a horizontal terrace, which is what's called a bottom plow terrace. And so you get this sort of a situation where the, the land is sloping down, where the plowing stops, you get a level terrace, and then the, the slope continues on again. But my guess is what we're looking at here is probably a road that's to the right of the wall. Um, and we've had some erosion um, on that road, which has meant that the, the level of the road is down lower. Um, from the image itself, it's hard to say much else about what the agricultural use was. Um, I mean, I, if there were a lot of small fist-sized rocks in that wall, if whoever took the shot saw a lot of small fist-sized rocks in it, then definitely it was crop field at one time. Uh, now, a lot of you know the crop fields were active around here, were active in the, you know, 1700s, early 1800s. And by the time we get in the middle 1800s, as rail starts to come in, a lot of those crop fields, which were mostly used for growing grain, get converted uh, with, you know, now market dairy farming, they get converted into either uh, pastures or hay fields. But if whoever took the shot can tell us if there's a lot of small fist-sized rocks in that wall, that would confirm that at one time it was crop field. 
Um, hi, Tom. Yeah, there were uh, quite a few smaller stones in there. All right. So definitely crop field. And is the area on the right a road? It is a road. So this is at the Quabbin um, at gate 16 uh -huh. in Shootsbury, Prescott area at the Quabbin. Okay. So definitely the 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 land to the left there enclosed in the stone walls was originally crop field. And again, my guess is probably by the time we get to the Civil War, it's already converted onto hayfield or pasture because, mm -hmm. um, you know, the bulk of the land and crop fields early on with self-reliant farms was in grains. And one of the grains grown was flax. And one of the surprising facts I found out about flax being grown in the early 1800s is it took two acres of flax to produce enough fiber in the stem, which made linen, to produce one twin bed sheet. So most farms back then had, you know, 15 or more acres in flax production. So uh, it's a lot of work plowing all that acreage, picking out the rocks, sowing the seeds, tending the crop, uh, you know, sickling it down, winnowing it out. Um, and so when rail comes in, uh, farmers are saying they're just going to take their, you know, their proceeds from dairy sales and buy grain and get rid of all that heavy labor and just convert those things to hay fields and crop fields. So mm -hmm. again, originally crop field, most likely in grain production and then transferring on into either pasture or hay field um, by around the time of the, of the Civil War. <clears throat> all right, another stone fence. Now this one doesn't seem to have a lot of small stones in it. And if it's just one stack of stones high, um, then it's a wall that's either um, separating out a hay field from a pasture or maybe two pastures. But again, it looks like the, the ground on the far side of that wall, even though it's sloping down to the left, it looks like it's pretty smooth and even on the top. And uh, if that's the case, that means it was plowed and all the pillows and cradles uh, that would have formed from tree falls uh, before that was opened up for agricultural land were removed by plowing. Now, when a live tree comes down, its roots rip up out of the ground. Uh, you know, the roots excavate what's called a pit or a cradle. And then the tip up roots, when they rot, form a mound or a pillow. So you get what's called pit and mound topography or pillow and cradle topography. Um, so those things can be visible in a forest, big ones for up to a thousand years. So if they're not there, that means they're removed by plowing. And that's what I'm guessing is the case in the slide. So if whoever took it, if they can remember, if the ground looked really smooth and even on the surface, um, that would sort of confirm what I think I'm seeing. Hi, Tom. I, I do not actually know who took this photo. It's one from Kestrel's um, archives. So I, I, unless one of my colleagues is watching and is the one who took the photo, I can't provide any more detail. All right. Well, it, it looks smooth and even to me. So I'm going to say probably originally Hayfield. I mean, it could be that, you know, often a lot of the, the small rock was dumped in the sidewalls. It was like if it was a crop field, it's easier dragging a, uh, you know, a stone boat across a slope rather than up or down. Um, but I'm still not seeing a lot of small rock. So I, I'm going to go with Hayfield on that one. Okay, so we definitely have here the work of Eurasian bittersweet. Um, a bittersweet vine was growing up this, this hardwood tree and really started to strangle it, which made the tree take on the spiral configuration. And then someone uh, removed the vine. Um, and it looks like, might not just been this vine, it looks like, you know, I don't see any uh, bittersweet in there anywhere. So maybe this site has been treated and all the bittersweet's been removed because uh, usually if you get a vine like that, that was a pretty good sized vine, you would have a lot of bittersweet around it and I'm not seeing any. So um, my guess is that somebody worked this site and got rid of the bittersweet. So Tom, I can also tell you, if you look a little further down, there is some man-made object embedded in that tree as well. Oh, well, I can see that. I wasn't sure what that was. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't this, know what, yeah, yeah, I can see that. So yeah, it looks like probably part of a 
chassis of a vehicle or something. Um, so we have, I guess, a, a dump there. That tree grew up, you know, within that dump. I'm sure that metal was there before the tree started growing. Yeah, this is actually something that folks who walk the uh, Silvio Conti Fort River um, Trail will probably recognize. So this is over at the Fort River Refuge. And it has been, um, you know, taken care of and managed. And and I, I'm sure they've gotten rid of some of the bittersweet, but not all of it. Well, but I mean, they they got rid of everything around this area because with a vine that would have been that big that was, you know, growing up like that, there'd be a heck of a lot all around that site. And I'm not seeing it in the foreground, so. Mm -hmm. All right, so this looks like we have a multiple trunk. I think it's a, a red oak. Um, and then it looks like a black birch growing in front of it, a, a smaller black birch. Um, the oak most likely was cut um, and then stump sprouted. And the black birch got in there. Generally, there had to be a little bit of a disturbance at the base of that oak tree. Um, it looks like we're in a forest that has a lot of good leaf litter coverage and in black birch has really tiny seeds and can't really seed into a healthy coverage of leaf litter. So it means that either, you know, maybe a deer was scratching for acorns at the base of that tree or turkeys were that opened up a germination site and the, and the black birch seeded in. Um, and it looks like, I guess, on the left of that, we have a woods road or a trail running off uh, towards the back of the image. All right, another multiple trunked red oak. In this case, looks like we have three trunks growing out of there. Um, again, this was a tree that was logged, stump sprouted. Um, it looks to me like those trunks are probably getting up around a foot and a half, maybe two feet in diameter, um, which means the original tree was probably maybe at least two feet in diameter, uh, possibly three, uh, which you know, means that's a pretty old tree. I, I know at that size, you're looking at a tree at least 80 years, could be 100 years when it was cut. And if these guys are like uh, 18 inches in two, or to up to two feet in diameter, they're probably at least about uh, 75 years of age. So, you know, it could be if you add those up that we had a tree growing here, you know, in the early part of the 1800s or something when it germinated from its acorn. Again, it looks like the ground is really smooth and even around it. Um, so again, probably agricultural land that was plowed. Uh, the first land abandonment around here was happening around 1840. So it could be that this was one of the first trees to seed in around that time. Um, and would mean that the acorn germinated about that time. All right, I can't tell if this is a deer rub um, I, it looks like it must be a rub. I mean, if this was like browsing by a porcupine or something, it'd be much neater. So this is a, either a deer rub or it's some sort of, um, you know, mechanical damage that was done in the bark of this tree. Um, uh, but my guess is probably deer, unless the person who took the shot knows something more about it. Okay. We were we were out looking for moose. Uh huh. But, um, so I'm not sure if that could be from moose, but um. Well, how how high off of the snow cover was it, or right. off? The um, probably only about two feet above the snow, which was about a foot. Yeah, that that would be a little low for moose. So I'm guessing probably deer. You know, rubbing its antlers uh, mm -hmm. would make a better guess. Okay. All right, some sort of a, a bark beetle. So um, this is, you know, a, a beetle that gets under the bark of a tree um, and then feeds on the cambial tissues. And, um, you know, while it's doing that makes all of this uh, sort of interesting pattern. So uh, in other words, these were eggs laid by a bark beetle. The eggs hatched out into, into larvae that then went to this pattern. And eventually when they get big enough, they emerge as adults. Um, I can't quite tell the species of tree because I don't see enough bark um, to be identifiable. 
and uh, and I I don't know. I'm not that good at identifying you know the different sort of tunneling of different bark beetles, so I can't use that to help me identify it either. But I think someone who is a tree pathologist probably could identify what that was just by the pattern of the excavation. Okay, I guess this looks like pretty active uh, beaver pond cutting. I mean, these look like uh, alders that were cut uh, by beaver and done pretty recently. You can see nice, clean, white tops where the cutting occurred. So um, I'm guessing we have an active beaver pond here. What's sort of interesting, it looks like um, this had been flooded. I'm just guessing that by the look of sort of the the dark color of the substrate, and it looks like the leaves had maybe mud on top of them. Um, so I don't know if like this had been flooded and then the dam was broken and drained or what's going on there, but uh, maybe the person that took the shot can tell us a little bit more, but it definitely looks like active uh, beaver cutting that didn't happen long ago. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, this is right near my house. And I'm the only one that knows about it because I don't tell people because I don't want them looking at it. But I think it was flooded. I uh, was sinking in a little bit. And the beaver pond, this little stream goes into um, the stream that makes the beaver pond. Uh -huh. And um, there's all little streams going around through here. So somehow it was flooded, whether it was original beaver pond or a lot of rain with all those little streams filling it up. I don't know. I'm not a yeah, not that's, an expert. That's all right. But I think you're right. I mean, it looks like, you know, the dam that held all this water back was probably compromised in a way. It drained mm -hmm. out when you took the photograph. I don't know if like it's been patched mm -hmm. up by the beavers and it's now flooded again, but it it did look pretty recently, you know, drained out by just looking at the ground there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's a basal scar. Again, it looks like it's on a hemlock. Um, something of that size makes me think that this tree uh, was next to an area where a log was skidded out and hit the tree uh, and ripped off the bark. You can also get uh, basal scars like this from fire. Um, where you get a, a pile of fuel on that side of the tree and it burns and uh, kills the cambial tissue under the bark. It wouldn't burn through the bark. Uh, it would kill the cambial tissue and then a few years later, the bark would fall off exposing the scar. Uh, whatever it was, it happened a good while ago. We can see the callus wood, which is that sort of smoother reddish looking growth growing over. And that looks like it's quite a bit. So. I'm guessing this happened a good while ago, you know, probably at least 30 years ago. Um, if whoever took the picture goes back and, and looks at that callus wood, they may be able to see fine vertical lines on the bark of the callus wood. Each of those lines would represent one year's worth of growth of the callus wood. <clears throat> and on hemlocks like this, if the, the lines are still readable, you can often date when the scar was produced uh, by counting how many of those vertical lines there are there. So I don't know if the person that took this photograph knows about doing that and they actually counted them and can tell us, you know, how many years before the photograph was taken, the scar occurred or not. But if they didn't, they might want to go back out and see if they can figure that out. Uh, I did not. Um, this was in a hemlock forest um, in Chutesbury that did show signs of some old um, logging roads, and it was next to um, a trail that's now grown in quite a bit, but definitely had, uh, it, it definitely looked like it, at one point it had been a logging road of some sort. That, would, that was going to be my guess. So if you ever see one of these again, and the wound hasn't healed over, take a careful look at the bark on that callus wood, see if you can see those vertical growth lines and just count them, and you'll be able to date the year that that wound was created. That's great. Yeah, thanks. 
All right, so we have at least two trees here that are tipped um, <clears throat> tipped over to the left. And these are wind tip trees um, so that uh, they were tipped at a young age uh, by the wind. And generally, when I say young, I'm talking about trees that are generally less than 20 years of age because as trees get older, <clears throat> excuse me, if they get tipped, there's so much inertia in the weight of their trunk, they usually come right down on the ground. I should mention trees that are weight bent, like bent over by snow or ice loading, their, their trunks are going to bend so that the, the bow is facing down to the ground. Uh, uh, wind bent trees, the bow is facing up towards the sky. So if you can um, actually figure out the direction the winds came from, in this, ca in this case, they came from the right. <clears throat> if, if you can figure out what direction that is to the right, that would give you an idea of the type of storm. If uh, to the right is west, that would be uh, a, a thunderstorm. Uh, if it's to the east, then we'd be looking at most likely a, a hurricane uh, that did that 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 wind uh, you know impact. So I don't know if the person who took the shot knows what the direction is to the right of the photo. Um, but that would give us an idea of the type of storm that did that. <clears throat> All right, so. Hi, yeah, um, yeah that, that, that was the, for the two on the left, that's facing east. All right, so. And then so, there's the one on the right that's bowed in the opposite direction. That's a real bow. Yeah, yeah. okay. So the one on the right, it's hard to read, but the one if they're facing east, if that wind came out of the east, then you're looking at some sort of a hurricane. And so where was the shot taken? Uh, on um, uh, uh, Rory Mountain in Mount, around Mount Toby. Yep. On the eastern facing slope of that. Yeah. Uh, I okay. think that one was facing east, looking across towards Mount, across from Rory Mountain. Okay. So... I mean, in that part of New England, you're getting a lot more hurricanes, you know, that are getting up that far into New England than I'm used to seeing where I was living up in Vermont and New Hampshire. So I can't really say what storm that might have been. It, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess if I could see the bark better on the trees, I could sort of age them and get an idea. But certainly winds out of these like that, you're looking at the result of... Uh, you know, a hurricane or certainly a degraded uh, tropical storm from a hurricane that made it into that part of New England. And again, only young trees get tipped like that. Uh, if they're bigger, they come they come right down. Thank you. Well, obviously, um, a fireplace uh, hearth with a you know a flue going up. I you know you know could be. A, it could be a you know a, a little cabin that somebody had. Um, I don't think it was used as a sugar house. I don't think that that setup would have worked well for sugaring. Um, yeah. But anyone know the history of this that took the shot? Again, this is one of my pictures, and it's right near where those bent trees were. I was, I was wondering if one could make any guesses as to what this might have been used for, like a sugar shack or something, based on its construction. Um, it's now deep in the woods. There's uh, there are no obvious roads. Well, there's a road not too far away, but yeah. um, I would I would have to get up there close to see it. But it looks like it has a fireplace hearth. So if that was the case, it wouldn't be very functional for uh, boiling down sap. So I'm just guessing like somebody's little cabin or something that they had there. But I'd have to really see it up close to be sure. All right, so a stump that has limb whorls. This is a white pine stump. I can see uh, one, two, three coming out at the same height in about the middle of the stump, and I can see a couple of tiers of limb whorls down below it. So definitely a white pine stump. It was cut. I can see the cut marks on the stump, and it was done a good while ago because there's not much left of it. So, um, you know, I'm guessing that tree was probably cut at least... Uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, but certainly a pine based on the limb whorls because hemlock uh, doesn't produce limb whorls, um, but pines do. And there they are right there. I guess Marilyn must be pointing them out very nicely.
All right, so this is this is definitely a, a single stack rock wall. Um, so again, probably not a lot of small rocks in it. Uh, although the ground on both sides again looks very smooth and even. <clears throat> so my guess is probably hay fields. Um, but if there were small fist sized rocks in there, then originally crop fields. So whoever took the shot, did they get to see if there are a lot of small fist sized rocks incorporated into that wall or not? I know there weren't. Okay. And then um, this was definitely a wall separating out hay fields um, from each other. Um, I mean, one could have been a pasture, but if it was, it was originally hay field because it looks like both sides were plowed because I'm not seeing any surface irregularities there. All right, so this is a, a tree that uh, came down, uh, a live tree that came down. So you can see the tip up, you can see the down trunk. Um, and my guess is that <clears throat> the soils here are pretty wet. We can see there's water in that depression where the tree came out of, and the roots are not very, um, they're, they're very planar. They're not like, you know, bringing up a lot of depth of material with them because they're probably all very surficial because of a high water table there. Um, and that means the trees are liable to wind throw because they're not anchored well because of a high water table like that. All right, interesting scar in another hemlock. And this is an old hemlock. Um, with the bark texture in that tree, I'm guessing this tree is probably at least 200 years of age. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what caused the scar. It's, it's the callus wood has a weird growth around it, but there was definitely a scar there. Um, but certainly a tree that is is quite old. I mean, it may, I mean, it's at least 200. And it may be a good deal older than that. I'd, I'd have to see the whole trunk. But whoever took it, um, what what was the diameter of the tree? Give me an idea. Uh, the tree is probably forty inches. Oh, it's forty inches. Yeah, it's. Wow. Uh, no, All no, right. take it back. Make What's that? Thirty. I'm holding my hands out. How that? How that? Thirty-two. 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 <laughs> Thirty-five. It's a big tree. Pretty big. <laughs> Well, it's not well. That's that's it. That's definitely an old tree because, um, because that's that bark. That bark is you know really coarse. So I'm gonna up my age to probably getting closer to 300 years in that tree. Um, were there other trees in the site like this that are this size with that coarse of a bark texture? Not too many. No, there not 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 there, and there were none that were that were scarred like that. Huh. Well. That tree has an interesting story. I'd like to see it for myself, but uh, definitely that is an old specimen. Um, it's not too far from where that old uh, cabin was. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't, I mean, it, I'm sure this has an interesting story. I'd have to see it in the context of the whole area, but definitely uh, that is an old hemlock. <laughs> what do you think caused that scar? That's a good question. It's a, it's an irregular shape and I'm, you know, I can't really say. I, you know, I'd need to see the whole context a bit of the site. Um, so I, I, I can't really say what caused it. Peter, what's the red on the tree? It's, it's a blaze. Yeah, that was that's definitely a blaze that was done somewhat recently. All right. Well. We got a number of things in this slide. I'll just start in the upper left. We have an old, looks like sugar maple there based on the bark. Again, you can see the ground here is really smooth and even, no pillows and cradles. So again, I'm thinking, um, you know, probably crop field. I, you know, I have no evidence of that from stone walls or anything, but um, if it was, that was abandoned a good while ago, or these trees, or maybe that tree, I, I, these trees might be border trees, that maple, and then there's one behind it that's larger diameter off on the left. So they may be running along a, a border uh, in there. Um, and it could be actually, since there's no stone at all, this could be on sandy soils, which would then change the whole complexion of the situation. Uh, 
dry sandy soils um, basically don't make really noticeable pillows and cradles because when trees, live trees uproot, they don't bring up anything with them. <clears throat> so if that was, you know, if those were two border trees there, the maple up front, that bigger one in the back to the left, um, and we don't have a stone wall, then I might be thinking that possibly we're on like a, a terrace, you know, getting down near the Connecticut River or something. Um, that's a possibility, but maybe whoever took the shot can tell me more about the site because it's it, it's hard to interpret all four that I'm seeing. My, yeah, again, this is Peter Curtis. Um, the lower right-hand uh, map shows exactly where those pictures were taken. I just was so impressed with the age and the quality of these trees. There's the maple, but there's both pine, white pine and, and hemlock. And one of the prettiest old growth, you can see the old, um, the, the, lian, the, the lianas there as well, the, the grapevines. So it obviously has to be cut. Why, why would these trees not have been harvested? I guess that everything up, upslope, they're all younger. What could cause, and it's right next to the railroad tracks. Um, they're at the base of yeah. Roaring Mountain, actually. Um, what would have, you know, the, is it just a, this, serendipity that these weren't cut. The trees aren't, and the pines, for example, are not multiple stems. So these are, these are straight, valuable yeah. trees. Well, I guess I'd have to see again the site and context to figure that out. Uh, it may be that, you know, the railroad right away incorporated them. I, you know, I don't yeah. know, but uh, it is sort of cool. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'd have to see the site, but I'm wondering if this could be river terrace, you know, uh, substrates of sand, which are good, can be good growing sites if they have silts in them. Um, yeah, I think that definitely is the yeah. case. I, mean, I think it's Roaring Brook or whatever goes right down there. I think this is a terrace. Absolutely. You're right on that. Sure. Yeah, well, then that makes sense to me. Yeah. No, yeah, thank you. Very <clears throat> All right, so these are, again, two more uh, hardwood trees that were wind-tipped, again, at young age. Um, the one that's in the foreground, the lowest living branch, uh, after being tipped, took off to become the new trunk. You can see a little bit of an elbow at its base. That's where the original trunk had continued up, but that got shaded and died away. The one in the background there um, managed to have two limbs to make it up. Um, and again, these were most likely tipped in the exact same wind event. And again, if we can tell where the wind came from, it came out of the on the left hand side of the photo. So, uh, Carrie, do you have any idea what direction that was to the left of those trees? I am geographically challenged, so I don't, <laughs> okay, don't well, know exactly. <clears throat> you can go back to the site with a compass and figure it out because if the wind was out of the west, you're looking at thunderstorm activity. If it's out of the east again, most likely hurricane or subtropical storms derive from hurricanes. Mm -hmm. All right, so obviously a beaver dam, but it looks like somebody maybe had opened it up is the water is not up to the top of the dam. And uh, beavers are very fastidious. They, if they're there, they're keeping their dam maintained. So the water level goes right up to the top. Um, so I don't know if someone opened up this dam or the beavers just abandoned the site and then uh, the dam was compromised and started draining out. But maybe the, the person who took the photo can uh, let us know. Hi. Um, I have not seen beavers there in a couple months unless I've just missed them. So <clears throat> um, it has been full and I've seen it lower and then I see it full. There is a three, I don't know what you call it, openings where the water can run out. And I actually can walk across that. Uh -huh. Is that um, a common thing to do? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's generally, okay. you know, if, you know, the, the water level drops a bit, uh, they, they become pretty stable to walk on. So. It's very stable. I was shocked. Yeah. Now I can get across there. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, I don't know if the beavers are. They're about a quarter mile away. 
in their lodge. And I don't know if it is, I've seen muskrat in the vicinity. Yeah. And I, maybe I just haven't run into the beavers. Well, my guess is they abandoned that site and have moved either upstream or downstream, whichever way they went. So that'll just get more opening. It will. Letting, letting the eventually, water out. Eventually the, the, that pond will drain and it'll develop marshy vegetation and shrubby swamp vegetation and then. Right. Would they block up, there's, like I said, there's three openings. Would they block up one of them? Or if, make they were, if they were around working this dam, they'd block everything up and keep the water right at the top of the dam. So they're not working in this site. They've, they've abandoned it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm seeing some hemlock branches down in the foreground. They look pretty good size. So I don't think that's the result of porcupines nipping branches, although it could be, but uh, they look like the, the, the one to the left and the right look pretty darn big compared to what I usually see when porcupines are nipping branches uh, for brows. Um, and I don't know what else to say about this unless whoever took the picture has a particular question they'd like to ask. Um, what causes, it, it, in the background, you can see a tree that has a branch down low and then it takes a pretty dramatic U up, yes. but the trunk is perfectly straight. So would yeah. that be another tree fall on a branch or? That would be a, a good guess that we had when, it, when the tree was pretty young, that'd be my guess that something weight wise hit it and bent the branch because the, the branch was probably forking originally and it bent that side down and then um you know the i think probably the lowest twig on that branch grew off and came up and that's why you have that really sharp elbow there so that would be a good guess all right so here we have the work of a of a uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker, and I'm guessing this is in a basswood tree. Um, sapsuckers have uh, four favorite trees that they drill these sap wells in, those being uh, paper birch, apple, basswood, and hemlock. And I have no idea why hemlock is in that group, but it is. Uh, it's one of their favorite trees. So these sapsuckers come along and they drill these, you know, parallel rows of sap wells and then they keep coming back and visiting them to drink the sap <clears throat> as well as eat any of the insects that have been attracted to the sap and they can work a tree like this for many many years revisiting those sap wells now i should mention that uh about 46 other species are attracted to the sap of these sap wells including a number of other birds mammals insects uh and one of the birds that uh frequency sap, sap wells is the uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. And um, as we get up into central and northern New England, we wouldn't have hummingbirds. We didn't have yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Our blooming season's not long enough to maintain a breeding population. So early in the season, sapsuckers are going to these sap wells, and that's where they're getting their nourishment until we get a good bloom happening. Um, and it might seem like they are uh, parasites of the yellow-bellied sapsucker because it's doing all the work and they're taking the sap. But studies have shown that uh, the hummingbirds can be really aggressive around the trees that they're going to. And they protect those trees from other consumers. They drive them away. So studies have actually shown that the hummingbirds are taking less sap than they're actually saving by driving other consumers away that the uh, sapsucker gets. And it's interesting, the uh, hummingbirds won't ever harass the sapsuckers. So it's sort of actually a mutually beneficial relationship between the two of them. All right, so we got uh, hemlock and yellow birch, and we've got like, it looks like, again, maybe a wind tip tree in the background, which may be another hemlock. <clears throat> we have um, some stilted rooted trees in here, which I'm guessing 
again, may have been from nurse stumps, the way the configuration looks. I'm not seeing like really prominent pillowing and cradling in there. Um, the only other option could be since the two hemlocks on the right have stilted rooting that's much lower than the small tree on the left, we could have some erosion happening in there. That's another possibility. But the tree to the left, uh, the small one that's just to the right of the yellow birch, that definitely was nurse stumped right in there. Um, but these other ones on the right-hand side of the image in the foreground, we could just have erosion that's happening that's exposed those because the, the roots aren't that high uh, in terms of their stilting. Um, but maybe the person that took the shot has questions or more information. I don't have questions. It was taken um, at Savoy State Park. So there is a lake. This is on like a hill and then there's a lake. So you would imagine that if there was a lot of rain, it could have washed down the hill to wash out some of the roots. I just thought it was so neat that there were so many roots around um, and things growing up that way, especially the tree sort of growing over the rock. Uh -huh. and the yeah, and you know, both yellow birch and hemlock um, do really well growing on rocks. Um, rocks, you know, eventually develop a mat of moss on them and that's a great germination site for small seeded shade tolerant trees and hemlock and yellow birch are both small seeded. They have tiny seeds that can't really do well this germinating on leaf litter in the soil, but in a moss mat, they germinate, then they grow their roots down around the rocks and uh, into the ground. So uh, if you're going to see trees around, you know, uh, you know, sort of the Massachusetts region that are growing on rocks, you are going to see the majority of them are going to be hemlock and yellow birch because of that. <clears throat> All right, another, uh, you know, cankerous burl. This is a really big one. It looks like it might be on a red oak. And uh, it's possible that I'm seeing a scar also running up and down the trunk of the red oak um, because it looks like the bark on that scar is not as coarse as the bark on either sides of it. Um, so it could be that we had a lightning strike that hit that tree, uh, blew off bark on that side, creating that scar, which is healed over. And it may be that was the uh, way that this fungus or bacteria or virus got in there to create this uh, tumorous growth uh, on the trunk. So there may be a connection there. All right, so here we have, it looks like it might be a maple that um, has a spiral growth in its trunk. If you, if you can see it, as you're looking up, the, the trunk is sort of spiraling to the right. And um, that's it right there, very good. And uh, so all of our trees are genetically programmed to spiral. It's part of what is called their phylotaxy. That means as the tree is growing up, its limbs get offset by the spiral so they're not growing right above each other, you know, above and below each other. So it tends to maximize for photosynthetic gain. So direction of spiral is genetically determined. And I'd say about 95% of our trees turn in this direction. As you're looking up, you'll see the spiral is turning to the right. About 5% go in the opposite direction. So again, direction is genetically determined, but the intensity of the spiral is environmentally determined. So if a tree is really growing up quickly, really um, stretching out its trunk, it's almost like taking a spring and pulling out, the nature of the spiral is reduced. But any tree that can't elongate quickly um, gets a more pronounced spiral. So that's really a great advantage if you're a tree growing on a, a windy ridge top, you're gonna get wind stunted, you're gonna have a very pronounced spiral in your trunk, which makes it really hard for trunk breakage to occur. But also uh, canopy suppressed trees, since they can't grow up quickly, get pronounced spirals. Open grown trees get pronounced spirals. I'm guessing that's going on here because it looks like uh, this tree did branch pretty low. And again, open grown trees are growing outwards and not upwards, so they get more pronounced spirals. So that's my guess what's happening in this case is that uh, this tree was open grown. Uh, allowing us to see this sort of pronounced spiral. 
I want to ask another question. This is actually in my backyard. And the reason that I took this picture, it's hard to see, but you see that rock that's in front of it. There's there's actually two very large flat slabs of, I think it's granite that are underneath this tree. They're about four and a half feet long to four and a half to five feet long and maybe three feet, maybe a little wider each one. And I was wondering, I was remembering something you said in a class a long time ago and wondering if maybe there were dead people under there. <laughs> if, that is, if that is granite. So Reeve, where, where was this picture taken? Where, where this are is you in at? my backyard. Where? Um, where, where oh, in Belchertown. Oh, well, you don't have granite there. So if this is truly granite, that that was brought there from somewhere else. Uh, uh -huh. And I'm not 100% sure what it is, but it's oh, quite a large, yeah, slab yeah. of, two large slabs of rock. Well, I mean, you could have a burial ground there. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, the house was built in the 1840s for whatever that's worth. Uh -huh. Well, and that's all I know. I was just kind of curious. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't, they're definitely not part of the site. You don't have any ledge yeah, no. cropping there or anything. So they were brought in for some reason to that spot. Right. What it is, I'd have to be at the site to, to, to say, but. Interesting. No. I guess and my other question is, are they harming the tree, which is sort of struggling? Like, would it be better for the tree to remove them or does it matter? No, no, the yeah, trees okay. aren't. And trees like, you know, their roots are growing out. If they start, in, you know, encountering, you know, obstructions, they just go around them or under them or, you know, whatever else. So they're not, they're not harming the tree. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, this is the last slide, Tom, and then we'll have a few minutes of question and answers. Here you go. All right, so here we have obviously a big slab of rock that's resting on another rock. Um, and underneath there, I can't tell. I mean, it looks, I mean, right away I'm thinking, is that a porcupine den? And that I'm looking at porcupine scat in there or not. Um, I can't really tell from the shot. Uh, <clears throat> and I guess I'd, whoever took the shot, maybe you can explain more about the rock here. That rock on top, it looks like it's a fairly big flat rock Yep. that's perched on another rock. Are there other rocks in here? Or is it just these two? You know, I think there might have been one more rock on the other side. Um, I can't remember, but the reason why I took it was because there were all these acorns underneath. Oh, so those I'm are acorns. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's that's definitely a, a cache for something that's been bringing those, you know, a rodent of some sort that's bringing those acorns under there and caching them under there. Um, you know, generally a hardwood forest like this, you usually don't have red squirrel red squirrels, which do cache things in piles like this. Um, and gray squirrels don't generally do this either. They're going to scatter them out in the woods and bury them. <clears throat> so this is probably some other critter that's bringing them under there and storing them there. Okay. Huh. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all who attended. I'm going to unshare here and then we'll open it up to about five minutes of questions if anybody has any um, remaining questions. I have a question. Go ahead, Michael. Yes, um, I live in Pelham, Mass. And uh, in my uh, my acreage, which is sloping upwards, and at the top of that, it flattens out. And it would have been very open. And uh, there are stone walls going east, west, and north, south. But in the middle of that are just these stone mounds of rocks, uh, maybe about waist high. I've uncovered some of them, but they're they're good sized rocks, and you know the size of your head, or some bigger, and uh, but they're just randomly you know scattered rock mounds. They're not connected to the stone walls, and I'm wondering what that says about not only why, but also what the land, what it might indicate the land was used for. Yeah, so I mean, I'd say. Um... Is the land, uh, even if it's sloping or not, is it smooth and even on the surface? No surface irregularities, mounding and stuff like that? 
not a lot of mounding. It's a little uneven. Okay. I mean, it's rolling up there, but it's, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's two possibilities. <clears throat> one is these are what are called clearance cairns. So they would be indicative that that was one time a crop field that a lot of rock was coming out and it's just easier to start building these mounds to get rid of the rock than carrying them over the stone walls. But we also do have Native American stonework. They made cairns as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if the the site is smooth and even, it's more likely they're clearance cairns from agricultural activity. But if you uh -huh. had if you had mounds like this, <clears throat> clearly out in <clears throat> land that was irregular with pillows and cradles and pits and mounds and stuff, that uh -huh. becomes much more indicative that it was probably indigenous uh, stonework. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Tom? If so, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. I have a question. Okay. Tom, could you explain what you mean by pillows and cradles? All right, so a live tree, when it falls down, its roots rip up out of the ground, excavating what's called a pit or a cradle. And then the down tree has its roots sticking up in the air. And in those roots is all the excavated earth. And as those roots rot, that earth uh, settles to make a mound or a pillow. See, it was called pit and mound topography or pillow and cradle topography. And as I mentioned, they're just evidence of live trees being taken down by wind or snow or ice loading. And um, like I said, large uh, pillows and cradles can be visible in our woodlands for up to about a thousand years. And with our pretty <clears throat> robust disturbance regime from thunderstorms, tropical storms, uh, wet snow, uh, <clears throat> ice storms, after a few centuries, our, our forest floors become just carpeted in pillows and cradles. I mean, the surficial topography of the ground is really irregular and lumpy and everything. So one of the first things I'm doing if I'm out in the woods is I'm looking at that superficial topography and it's smooth and even. That means all those features were removed by plowing at one time in the past. Hmm. So pillows and cradles just maybe a more <clears throat> poetic way of talking about pits and mounds. So to uh, follow up on that, um, so what happens is the, uh, um, this is a question, it is what happens that as the, as the um, carcass <laughs> uh, breaks down, uh, it becomes earth and then, but it retains the shape of the, uh, I mean, how, do, how does it become incorporated into the landscape as well, the <clears throat> regular? So, you know, when, that, when a tree is uprooted, it's not just the roots coming up out of the ground, it's bringing up a lot of earth with it. Right. As the roots rot and the tree rots, that earth settles into this mound. Oh, okay. And so it just takes a long time for gravity and other you know, physical forces to remove that mound and level the ground out again. That's why I'm saying it takes a long time. It takes centuries and centuries and centuries. So mm -hmm. uh, these things last uh, you know, a good long time. And since they're, you know, each forest is probably picking up a number of them every century, you know, after a few hundred years, they're really getting carpeted in these features. So are we, are we talking, um, are we talking like small mounds and pits? Or are we talking about, you know, tall, like bold, you know, like, like erratic boulders? Kind of thing? It, 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 it's, it depends on the size of the tree. So I've seen some pillows and cradles, big ones that uh, the pillow will rise up maybe three feet off the ground. And they're uh -huh. elongate. They're not just circular. They're elongate, and they may stretch as much as fifteen feet in width. And then the cradle will be elongate as well, and maybe another three feet deep. So you so can stand in these things. And the difference is about six feet. But wow. you know, you, but you can get smaller ones that are only going up maybe you know a foot and a foot deep. So and not as big in terms of length. Uh, but they're not circular. They tend to be, you know, more lens-shaped, 
because mm -hmm. that's the way the tree's roots are. They're not, you know, this little ball, they're spreading out like this. So the whole thing comes up like that. And then and then the um, and then the the under underbrush and uh, new forest growth will grow up on top of it. Yes, and sometimes uh, you will get like if you get small seeded uh, trees, they can actually seed into that root system tipped up, um, and they start growing roots down through it. And then when that whole thing rots away, you'll get these stilted rooted trees, but they're the roots look more like the delta of a river going down into the mound or the pillow. Um, so yes, you can sometimes get trees growing right up in those features. Fantastic, thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. Do I see your hand up, Tom? Yes. Hi, okay. Tom. I, I know this is a long shot, but do you ever lead tours through the woods? Uh, yeah, no, I do. I mean, I'm I do programs that you know are are walks through the woods and stuff. And yeah. Can you get on a mailing list so that you can know about these? <laughs> well, I don't have a mailing list or a website or anything like that. I I don't do a lot of self promotion, but um, I'd say if you're really interested, just email me. You can get my email from from Marilyn. It's just twessels at antioch edu and say, here's where I live. And, you know, if I have anything on my docket that I'll be in the in that region, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. It was kind. Enjoyed it. I I have one of your earlier, uh, one of your later books. The yeah, forensics. obviously. Forensics. Yeah, right to what we're doing today. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you again, Tom. Thank you again, everybody, for attending, for your great interest in learning how to read our forest and landscape here in New England. Um, if Tom is available for an in-person walk, we'll certainly let you know. And um, again, thank you for your interest in Kestrel as well and support of our work. And we hope that you enjoyed this program. <laughs>